Well, those are good friends. <clears throat> that was good music. And this is so far a pretty good event. We made sure it was going to block you, though. Oh, it's okay. Um, this chocolate. It should be a good angle. One of Brooke's specialties. It ain't bad. Um, dessert is being served, by the way. However, the show must go on. So while the dessert is being served, I'm going to thank all the volunteers, and you know who you are. You know who you are, volunteers. But especially Al Needleman. Al Needleman is our dedicated and sometimes relentless registrar welcoming everybody in. Al, thank you. Thank you. He's also, you might say, our most senior member. Um, it doesn't mean anything except he's mature. Um, and by the way, Al Needleman and Carol are forming uh, a singles club. Big V, Big S. Singles get together. Um, the club is going to be starting, we're forming it, or they're forming it. In coming months, you can sign up and um, don't leave your spouse, you know, but, you know, well, if you want to. Well, thanks again to the beautiful musicians, and, <clears throat> and thank you, Jack. Jack handed me these two books. There are many other great books out there, but these are two examples of books that can help you or someone you know move along the path. This one's called Becoming Vegan. The Complete Guide to Adopting a Healthy Plant-Based Diet by Brenda Davis and Asanto Molina. And this one, but I could never go vegan. I could never go vegan, but someone actually did. And then she wrote this book with 125 recipes and zero excuses. There's enough good food in the vegan movement for anyone. But guess where most of the information about food and nutrition is? Right there. Nutritionfacts.org has kind of cornered the market on vegan nutrition, wisdom, knowledge, science-based. And just by an amazing coincidence, tonight, many of you are here for a specific reason. Some people stumbled in. Is there a free meal here? Can I get some tea? Okay, we got you covered. Um, but Dr. Michael Greger is a founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. That's one of the doctor organizations that are mostly really good doctors. Okay, the other doctors are good, but these are the really good doctors. <laughs> and he happens to be a New York Times best-selling. Can I have your attention, please? Because um, it's not that crucial that the room be quiet and attentive for me, but in about a minute, we need to kind of like get ready for a presentation. It's coming soon. As soon as I finish this introduction, could people on the food line and people off the food line, you know, there's an old Yiddish word that is shah. Shh. 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 
That means respectful silence. Thank you. Because Dr. Gregor, <coughs> good job. But by the way, and by the way, Brooke Katz is otherwise known as Chef Brooke Katz. Guess whose food you're eating tonight? Guess how many people make this food tonight? Give me a number. How many people prepared all this food for the whole room? No, it can't be one. Come on. Give me a reasonable number. Six. Did I hear 30? Nine, 11, 14.1? No. Brooke Katz is... Um, he's an army of one. He's an army of one. And uh, we are really appreciated. No one goes out of here. I'm just going to say that Brooke's actual goal is to educate people. But instead of lengthy sentences, paragraphs, and convoluted ideas, he says, open up. Did you get that vegan bite? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, a few more things. So, Dr. Gregor is an international speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public, and public health. He's lectured at the World Affairs Conference. He testified before Congress. And really, really important, he was an expert witness. Excuse me. He was an expert witness at the Oprah Winfrey Howard Lyman versus the Cattlemen at that landmark trial. And, of course, he went to the Cornell School of Agriculture, Tufts University School of Medicine. He's a director of public health and animal agriculture and a small, unknown organization with, I think, 14 million, 14 million members and associates called the Humane Society of the United States. And nutritionfacts.org. You want an education in a minute or, let's say, four minutes? Go to nutritionfacts.org. Or, how about Dr. Gregor live, right now. Good evening. It's actually a good angle since you said that. Allow me to begin on a personal note. <laughs> This is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandma was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries, basically run out of plumbing at some point. Confined in wheelchair, crushing chest pain, there was nothing more they could do. Her life was over at age 65. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers, and what happened next is documented in Pritikin's biography. She was one of the death's door people, like Francis Greger from this strange place called North Miami, Florida. Ended up in Pritikin's early sessions in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease and an claudication. Her condition so bad she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of a wheelchair, but she was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of uh, my grandma taken at her grandson's wedding 15 years after 
doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this earth until age 96 with her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. When Dr. Dean Ornish published his lifestyle heart trial years later, proving that a plant-based diet could reverse heart disease, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white, proven with quantitative angiography, and published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, but nothing happened. <laughs> Leading me to wonder, wait a second, if effectively the cure to our number one killer could have, you know, get, to, you know, lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that might help my patients but just need to have a you know, corporate budget driving its promotion? I made it my life's mission to find out. Every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't have to. And then compile the most interesting, most groundbreaking, most practical findings and new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no commercial sponsorship. Um, uh, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service, a labor of love, new videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. <laughs> set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what, what may be one of the great health advances of the 20th century, according to one of the great medical figures of the time, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that our major and most common deadly diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. For example, in the African population of Uganda, coronary heart disease almost non-existing. So wait a second. Our number one cause of death, almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein, almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. So wait a second, maybe the Africans were just dying early from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age <laughs> match heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender match autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our number one killer. In fact, they're so blown away that went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, and still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand. Whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that even live like the U.S., but were rare or even non-existent in places that centered their diets around whole plant foods. These are among the most common diseases, like obesity, for example. Hiatal hernia, one of the most common stomach problems. Varicose veins and hemorrhoids, the two most common venous problems. Colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer. Diverticulosis, number one disease of the intestines. Appendicitis. Number one cause of non-emergency of abdominal surgery, gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our commonest cause of death here, but a rarity among plant-based populations. 
which suggests heart disease may be a choice, like cavity. You know, we've known, uh, if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavity. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no flossing, <laughs> yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> so why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through dietary changes? Well, simple. Right? The pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. Look, that's fun. It is, you know, as long as people understand the consequences of their actions, I and mean, as physicians, what more can we do? If you're an adult and you think the benefits outweigh the risks for you and your family, then you go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan. <laughs> but what if instead of the plaque in our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries? Another disease that can be prevented through dietary changes. Okay, now what are the consequences for you and your family? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. The number one reason we, all our loved ones, will die is heart disease. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, pardon me there, is, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, the arteries of nearly all kids already have the beginning of what they call fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease, and then these plaques start building up in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart is called a heart attack, in our brain, the same disease, we call it stroke. So if there's anyone here this evening older than age 10, <laughs> then the question isn't whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether you want to reverse the heart disease that you likely already have. Is that even possible? You know, researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of diet followed by people that did not get heart disease. Their hope was maybe we can slow the disease process, maybe even stop it, but instead something miraculous happened. Their disease started to reverse, to get better. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the choice. Never given the chance. This uh, dramatic improvement in blood flow on the left, this was after just three weeks eating healthy. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shit really hard on a coffee table, you can get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally. If you just stand back, let your you know, body work its magic. But what if you kept, what if you kept <laughs> kicking that same coffee table in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> you never heal. You'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin really? They'd be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills I'm for. Thank heavens for modern medicine. 
You know, it's like when heart patients take nitroglycerin for chest pain. A tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause. Right? Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It's like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Like, your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until when? For a cigarette of the day, re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite. When all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is just stand back, get out of the way, stop re-injuring ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. We've known about this for decades. 1977 American Heart Journal. Cases like Mr. F.W. here. Heart disease so bad couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains. No pain. <laughs> now, there are these classes, new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. Uh, they can cost thousands of dollars a year, but uh, at the highest dose, may be able to prolong exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> it does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper. They can work better because you're actually treating the cause of the disease. Killer number two in the United States is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues were able to show that the progression of prostate cancer could be reversed with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, and no wonder. If you take people eating the standard American diet, drip their blood onto cancer cells growing in a petri dish, you can cut down the growth of those, uh, that cancer a little bit, about 9%. But put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was for men and prostate cancer, number one cancer killer specific to men. For women, it's breast cancer. So we wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer. But look, we didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of human breast cancer. Here's the before. Cancer cell growth powering rate 100%. This is after two weeks eating healthy. This is what's called a photomicrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is researchers uh, laid down a confluent layer of a, a breast cancer, so like a, a carpet of breast cancer, and then they drip the blood, eliminating the standard American diet onto that cancer, and you can see it kind of breaks up the cancer in little cancer continents here. But then if you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and two weeks later retest them again so they act as their own controls, Two weeks later, same women, and this is all you're left with. Wow. Just a few individual cancer cells left before and after just two weeks eating a plant-based diet. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is is uh, great, but getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Their bodies are able to reprogram the breast cancer cells, forcing them to early retirement. Uh, this is what's called the tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. 
So as you can see, even women eating pretty poor diets um, uh, can kill off a few cancer cells, like here's one right there. But what then, what if you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, two weeks later, their blood can do this. It's like you're an entirely different person inside. The blood circulating throughout these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Do we want blood that just kind of, you know, rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Now this dramatic strengthening of cancer defenses was after two weeks of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. So, well, wait a second, if you do two things, I mean, how do you know what role the diet played? So they decided to put it to the test. This is what we saw. So this is measuring cancer cell clearance. This is what we saw before, the benefits of healthy diet and exercise. Um, in this case, on average for 14 years, 14 years on a plant-based diet along with mild exercise, just like out walking every day, that's the kind of cancer cell clearance you get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average sedentary American. You see a little burger. Uh, little burger right Which is essentially non-existent. Okay, but what about this middle group here? Instead of 14 years of a plant-based diet, 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years of daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics, <laughs> they wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise helped. No question, but literally five thousand hours in the gym appear to be no match for a plant-based diet. This is that same tunnel imaging we saw before. Even if you're a couch potato living off of fried potatoes, you are not totally defenseless. You can kill off a few cancer cells. If you exercise five thousand hours in the gym, you can kill cancer cells off left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer Tush than a plant-based diet. This is because we think that animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, increases the levels of something called IGF-1 in our body, insulin-like growth factor 1, this cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. But if we go on a plant-based diet, drop our animal protein consumption, IGF-1 levels drop, and if we continue to eat healthy, they drop even further. And our levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is one of our body's ways of protecting itself from excessive growth, protecting itself from cancer. It's like our body's emergency break. Sure, in as soon as two weeks, you can drop your body's production of IGF-1, but wait a second. What about all the IGF-1 you had circulating in your body from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your body releases, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up any excess IGF-1, pull it out of the system, and your protective levels go up within weeks, continue um, to get better as one eats healthier longer. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 is the villain. This is what we saw before. Start eating healthy and moving. Your cancer cell growth plummets. Cancer cell death shoots up. But this is the interesting column here. What if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 you banish from your system because you started being healthy? You erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So this may be why the largest study, prospective study on diet and cancer ever shows that the incidence of all cancers combined lower among those eating more plant-based compared to those eating meat. Less animal protein means less IGF-1, means less cancer growth. How much less cancer? Those eating lots of protein, middle age, 75% increased risk of overall mortality. 
and fourfold increased risk of dying from cancer, but not all proteins, specifically animal protein, which makes sense given the IGF-1 mechanism we just talked about. The academic institution sent out a press release with a memorable opening line, that chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Noting that, you know, fourfold increased risk in dying from cancer, that's comparable to what might one see uh, smoking cigarettes. So what was the response from the nutrition community to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health as smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist says it was potentially dangerous to compare the effects of smoking with the effects of meat and dairy. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just in bad form. <laughs> so let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and dairy thing. Shh. This reminds me of a famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that down, tried to downplay the risk by saying, look, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day may be twice as bad, um, three times as bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 62%. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or tripling your risk of heart disease eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So, they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risk from second hand smoke, we well below that of other everyday activities. So hey, breathe deep. <laughs> That's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed because getting shot is so much worse. <laughs> uh, how about neither? <laughs> Two risks don't make a right. <laughs> of course, we know Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <laughs> Just saying. Every year, the CDC compiles the 15 leading causes of death. We've talked about killer number one, heart disease, killer number two, cancer. Just 13 causes of death to go. <clears throat> uh, let me run through the list quickly. Top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that's so 2007. Now it's heart disease, cancer, and COPD. Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, a plant-based diet can be used to help prevent emphysema, may even be used to treat emphysema, um, significantly improving lung function over time. But you know, the tobacco industry had viewed these landmark findings a little differently. I mean, if adding pl plants to our diets can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add plants to cigarettes? <laughs> And indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. Oh. <laughs> smoking mice. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition of Fruit extracts, the burger patties, was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties with a distinct purplish color. Um, although one evidently can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice, you can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds. Though there were complaints that the grape seed particles became visible in the final product, you know. If there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. Right? Oh, oh, picking this? Okay, my graces. <laughs> stroke is killer number four. Preventing strokes may be all about eating potassium rich foods. Yet most Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. And by most Americans, I'm talking more than 98% of Americans. 
98% of Americans eat potassium deficient diets because 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes with the words pot ash. You take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce the ash, you're left with pot ash and yum, potassium, vegetable alkali. Uh, it's a true story, but who can tell me one plant food particularly high in potassium? Banana. Banana. Of course, bananas. I, no, I like, that's the only thing everybody knows about nutrition. That's like, uh, <laughs> like, Chiquita must have had a great PR firm or something. But, uh, turns out, bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of potassium, coming in at number 86, right after fast food vanilla milkshakes. And I was like, and then It's funny, I was, uh, when I was writing the new book, I went back to make sure that the you know, USDA had an extent banned in their database, and they had. Now, bananas don't even make the top thousand sources, coming in at number 1,611, right after Reese's Pieces. <laughs> Did you not? The most concentrated source of potassium in the American diet are number one, green number two, beans, and number three, dates. We have a date lover, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Bananas don't even make the top thousand. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is our sixth leading killer. You know, 20 years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10. Four million Americans currently afflicted. The latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease says the two most important things you can do, cut down your consumption of meat, dairy, and junk, and replace those foods with what? With vegetables, legumes, which is beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, fruits, whole grains. This is based in part on data going back 20 years now that those who eat meat, red meat, white meat, doesn't matter, between two and three times increased risk of becoming demented later in life. And the uh, longer one eats healthy, the lower one's risk drops. Killer number seven, type two diabetes, a disease that can be prevented, arrested, and reversed with a plant-based diet, something we've known since the 1930s, where a quarter of the diabetics were able to get off insulin altogether after five years. But, you know, plant-based diets are relatively low-calorie diets. I mean, so maybe the diabetics just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you need to do is put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they didn't lose any weight. And then you could see if plant-based diets have particular benefits for diabetics beyond just all the weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait 44 years, but here it is. Uh, researchers weighed participants every day. If they started losing weight, they were made to eat more food. In fact, so much food, many of the participants had problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually they adapted. So no weight loss. So, okay. Was a plant-based diet still effective even with zero weight loss? Well, Insulin needs were cut 60%, and half the diabetics ended off all, all their insulin altogether. Wow, how many years did this take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So, for example, um, diabetics with diabetes as long as 20 years injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later off none. Without even any weight loss, still diabetes gone. Diabetes for 20 years, and then gone in less than two weeks, thanks to a plant-based diet. Diabetes for 20 years, because no one had told her about a plant-based diet. Here's patient number 15, 
32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. And as a bonus, or cholesterol drop like a rock to under 150 in 16 days. And just like you know, modest changes in diet are only going to get you modest reductions in cholesterol. You know, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Everything in moderation may be a truer statement than many people realize, right? Making moderate dietary changes for diabetics can leave them with moderate blindness, uh, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputations, maybe just a few toes or something, right? Everything in moderation um, uh, uh, is uh, not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study showed that uh, um, diets high in meat, eggs, dairy could be harmful health of smoking. Supposedly suggested that those who eat lots of meat, um, eggs, and dairy four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. If you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, eating only a moderate amount of animal protein, they only had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killing number eight is kidney disease, a disease that can be both prevented and treated with a plant-based diet, and no wonder kidneys are highly vascular organs. Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. Number three, cholesterol. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of our kidneys based on data like this showing plugs of fat literally clogging up the works and autopsy to human kidneys. And animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function causing what's called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. So if you give somebody tuna fish, for example, you can see significant um, increases in pressure within the kidneys within one, two, three hours after a meal for both diabetics and non-diabetics. So we're talking not adverse effects decades down the road, but we're talking within like minutes going into our mouth. Okay, but what if instead of having a tuna fish salad sandwich, we had a tofu salad sandwich with the exact same amount of protein? Nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing. Our bodies, our kidneys can handle plant protein without even batting an island. So why does, why does animal protein cause that overload reaction but not plant protein? We think it's because of the inflammation triggered by animal protein. How do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that protein leakage hyperfiltration response to meat ingestion. And then there's the acid load. Right? The uh, consumption of animal products causes the formation of acid within the kidneys um, this can cause something called tubular toxicity, damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within the kidneys. Animal foods tend to be acid-forming within the body, whereas plant foods tend to either be neutral or actually base-forming, alkaline, counteracting some of the acid in our kidneys. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease may lie in the produce aisle rather than the pharmacy. No surprise that plant-based diets have been used to successfully treat kidney dysfunction for decades. So here's the kind of protein leakage one gets on what's called the standard low sodium diet, which is like the standard thing doctors might put um, kidney failure patients on. Switch to a supplemented vegan diet back to conventional, plant-based, conventional, 
plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what was going into their mouths. Killer number nine, respiratory infection. You say, okay, oh, wait a second. What possible role could diet play in respiratory infections? Well, obviously, you haven't seen my video, Kale in the Immune System. <laughs> Talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale, is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold. But this was in a petri dish. What about in people? Well, if you take older men and women, split them up into two groups, half continue the regular diet, the other half adding just a few servings of fruits and vegetables to their daily diet after they get their pneumonia vaccination, their pneumovax vaccination, what happens? Significantly um, better protective immune response in the um, higher fruit and vegetable group. Um, uh, this is not cutting out meat. This is just adding a few servings of produce to their daily diet can significantly boost your immune function. Killer number 10 is suicide. We've known for years that those that eat healthy also feel healthier. Um, those that eating plant-based diets, for example, have only half of the depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to those that eat meat. We think it's because of the arachidonic acid, this inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found predominantly two places in chicken and eggs in the American diet. But if you take people eating a standard American diet, remove meat, remove fish, remove poultry, remove eggs as well from their diet, you can see a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. Why? Well, this arachidonic acid may be adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, but we can clear that inflammation out of our brains within just two weeks by cutting down on eggs, chicken, and other meat. It um, works, oh, so what about, uh, am I just cherry picking here? I mean, what about all the other studies that show that different diets improved mood? Other randomized controlled trials, there aren't any. This uh, latest review, uh, said that only the plant-based diet intervention fit the bill. The only um, diet proven in its way to actually improve mood. So it's kind of hard to cherry pick when there's just one cherry. <laughs> <laughs> Works in a workplace setting too. You improve the diets of employees. You think uh, significant improvements not only in physical function, which you'd expect, but also vitality and mental health. The largest such study. Um, so, improving worker productivity, of course. Um, the largest such study across 10 corporate sites at GEICO found a significant improvement in depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning. So these lifestyle interventions uh, can improve uh, mental as well as physical health and plant-based diets are a particularly effective tool. Killer number 11, it blood infections. Sure, foodborne bacteria can burrow through the intestinal wall, get into the bloodstream, but in women, can creep up into their bladders. We've known for years that it's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that cause um, bladder infections, but only recently did we discover where this reservoir of UTI-causing bacteria was coming from, and now we know it's chicken. We have DNA fingerprinting proof of uh, a direct link between farm animals, meat, bladder infections, solid evidence that, uh, that uh, urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal to human disease. Hmm. So wait a second, can't you just cook the meat through, use a meat thermometer, right? No, because of cross-contamination. So if you take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their own home as they normally would, a multitude of antibiotic resistant E. coli jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you can incinerate that chicken to ash. <laughs> you don't even have to you don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the oven. Thanks to cross-contamination. 
Within days, the chicken bacteria had multiplied to become a major part of the person's gut flora. Uh, chicken bacteria was like taking over. See, okay, well, wait a second. What if you're really careful about using safe handling techniques? What if you actually follow the official USDA guidelines that no one does, but you're supposed to actually spray everything with like a dilute bleach solution and wipe all the common kitchen surfaces down with bleach? Well, even if you do that and then have researchers come into your home and swab around the kitchen, they can still find significant levels of salmonella, campylobacter, significant serious human pathogens from chicken. In fact, the reason that we see more bacteria from feces in the kitchen sink than on the toilet seat is because people tend to wash their chickens in the sink, not the toilet. All right, but the good news is it's not like you eat chicken once and you're colonized for life. In this study, the good bacteria only seemed to last about 10 days before your good bacteria could kind of muscle it out of the way. The problem is that many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs into their system. So wait a second, you can't sell unsafe cars. You can't sell unsafe toys. How is it even legal? to sell unsafe meat. They do it by blaming the consumer. Look, as one USA poultry microbiologist said, look, raw meats are not idiot proof. They can be mishandled when they are. It's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. <laughs> now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that has most of the responsibility. If we get sick, it's our fault. It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. The head of the CDC's food poisoning division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. She asked, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They just got FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus that they can spray on the meat. There's uh, been concern among the industry about the consumer acceptance of these so-called bacteriophages may present some of a challenge to the food industry. So, of course, they're not going to label it or anything. Uh, but uh, if, you, if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly pupae of pork president. This is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Wait, it's a low cost and so think about it. And look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, there have been no reports of that the maggots have any serious diseases. Right? So they must be filled with some kind of antibacteria, something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? No. I didn't think so. So, let's take some maggots, three days old, wash them off, towel off, a little Vitamix action here, voila! Safer meats. We've done kidney failure, what about liver failure? We know for decades that liver failure could be treated with a plant-based diet, significantly reducing the toxins. <coughs> That would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. Uh, though one has to admit there are some people eating plant-based diets with worsening liver function. They're called alcoholics, living off of potatoes and corn and barley. In fact, strictly plant-based. But they're not doing so good. I'm not sure. Next on the list is high blood pressure affecting nearly 78 million Americans. That's one in three American adults. And as we get older and older, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, the majority of Americans have high blood pressure. You say, well, wait a second. I mean, if most of us get high blood pressure, maybe it's less a disease and more just you know, an inevitable consequence of aging. 
No. We've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. So the measure of the blood pressure is a thousand people living in rural Kenya who are centering their diets around grains and beans and vegetables, fruit and greens. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures go down. <laughs> And the lower the better. You know, this whole 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. We now know that even people under 120 over 80, I mean, if you went to your doctor with 120 over 80, you'd get a gold star. But now we know that even people under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, it's actually 110 over 70. Say, wait a second, 110 over 70? Is it even possible to get down that low? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. That's So, uh, two years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow, they must have low rates of heart disease, right? Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of atherosclerosis, our number one killer, was found. Rural China, too, 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70-year-olds, same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. China, Africa, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common was that they were plant-based day to day, with meat only eaten on special occasions. Now, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, as the American Heart Association has pointed out, the only folks getting it down that low are those eating strictly plant-based diets coming in at 110 over 65. This is the largest study of plant-based eaters um, uh, to, done to date here in North America based on 89,000 Californians. As one goes from meat eater to kind of flexitarian to just eating fish to just eating eggs and dairy to strictly plant-based, one sees a stepwise drop in blood pressure rates as one gets more and more plant-based. Same thing with diabetes and obesity stepwise drop as one gets healthier and healthier. Um, so I uh, guess you can eliminate the you know, vast majority of your risk by eating healthy, but I think the most important thing about this slide is that it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along the spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefits. And in terms of blood pressure data, you can show this experimentally. You take vegetarians, give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take meat eaters and you remove meat from the diet and their blood pressures go down within just seven days. And this is after many of them had to eliminate their blood pressure medications or reduce their dose. Because if you actually treat the cause of the disease, you can't be taking blood pressure pills if you have normal blood pressure, drop too low. Lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. So, does the American Heart Association recommend a no meat diet? No, they recommend this low meat diet called the so-called DASH diet. Okay, why not vegetarian? I mean, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they were aware. I mean, they chaired the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. The DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. <laughs> now, you can see what they were thinking. Right? I mean, look, just like drugs never work, <laughs> unless you actually take them. Diets never work unless you actually eat them. So they're like, oh, no one's going to eat strictly vegetarian. So 
if we soft pedal the message, maybe on a population scale, we'll actually do more good. Okay, but tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a family member to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the public the truth. Killer number 14 is Parkinson's disease. Is a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that most studies done today show this link between Parkinson's disease and dairy product consumption. Why might that be? Well, there's evidence that our milk supply is contaminated with neurotoxins. So we find high levels of pesticides and other um, uh, toxic chemicals in the brains of Parkinson's patients as well as in the milk supply. We're talking about things like tetrahydroxyquinoline, which is a pollutant found um, uh, mostly in cheese, actually, but that's actually what the scientists use to try to induce the disease in the laboratory um, in primates. Um, so, you know, the, there's been calls on the dairy industry to self-police themselves and do toxin screenings of their own milk. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> um, uh, of course, you can just, I mean, you can just choose not to drink it, but then what would happen to your bone? <laughs> That's a marketing play. Look at the actual science. Uh, milk consumption does not appear to benefit um, a hip fracture risk, whether you're drinking as an adult, whether you're drinking as a teen, doesn't. Um, work either way. In fact, it may actually have increased fracture risk. This could explain why populations with the highest milk consumption also have the highest hip fracture rate. So researchers in Sweden decided to put it to the test. 100,000 men and women fall for up to 20 years, and milk drinking women had higher rates of what? Higher rates of death. Higher rates of heart disease, more cancer for each daily glass of milk, those women that ate three glasses a day had nearly twice the risk of dying prematurely. And they had more bone and hip fracture risk, more milk, more fracture. And men also had higher rates of death. Yet for some reason, you never see milk ads like this. I'm not sure why. <laughs> And then killer 15 is uh, what's called aspiration pneumonia, caused by swallowing difficulties due to a stroke or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, which we've already covered. So here we are. Here's the top 15 reasons Americans die. A plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them. It can help treat more than half of them and even reverse the course of disease in some of them, including in some cases our top three killers. Now look, there are, you know, there are drugs that can help too. There's cholesterol-lowering statin drugs, the heart, there's you know, insulin injections and sugar pills for diabetes. Usually it takes a couple different classes of high blood pressure medications to really push people's blood pressure down. But the same diet does it all. It's not, it's not like there's like a brain-healthy diet and that's somehow different from a heart-healthy diet. You know, a liver-healthy diet is a kidney healthy, is a whole body-healthy diet. One diet to rule them all. And what about drug side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash here. Prescription drugs kill. More than 100,000 people every year. Wait a second. 100,000 deaths every year? Well, that means the sixth leading cause of death in the United States is actually doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading killer is me. <laughs> Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> oh, seriously, uh, compared to 15,000 American vegetarians, those that eat meat, uh, about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, and acids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, um, as well as insulin. So, you know, plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, for people that don't like paying for drugs, and for people that don't like risking drug side effects. Want to solve the health care crisis? I've got a solution. <laughs> There's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. 
So anytime anyone tries to sell you on some new diet, do me a favor. Ask them a simple question. Say, so, wait a second. Has this new diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, the number one reason me and all my loved ones will die. If the answer is no, why would you even consider it? Right? I mean, if that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse number one killer of men and women, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove another one? And the fact that it can also be useful in preventing, arresting, and reversing other leading killers like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths in the United States are preventable and related to nutrition. According to the most rigorous analysis of risk factors ever performed, the number one cause of death in the United States and the number one cause of disability in the United States is our diet. Bumping tobacco smoke to number two, cigarettes now only kill half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. So, let me end with a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker in the 1950s. <laughs> The average per capita cigarette consumption was 4,000 cigarettes a year, meaning like the average person walking around smoked a half pack a day. The media was telling you to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit, stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim, <laughs> and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh. <laughs> Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for youth-oriented cigarettes. They wanted to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shame. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better safe than sorry, and smoke. <laughs> Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. No woman ever says, no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked from <laughs> until he got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. This is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Yeah, sure, you know, some doctors smoke camels, but others prefer luckies. So there was a little you know, disagreement there. The leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. I mean, how could their, I mean, who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. I mean, how could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink. Doesn't say much for the water. Maybe up in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry if you do get irritated, no problem. Your doctor can write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is an ad from the Journal of the American Medical Association. So if mainstream medicine is saying smoking on balance may be beneficial, I mean, if the AMA is saying that, where could you turn if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? She was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak, before he died of throat cancer. 
You know, if by some miracle there was a smokingfacts.org website back then that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filter, you would have become aware of studies like this. This is a Adventist study out of California published in 1958 showing that non-smokers had at least 90% lower lung cancer rates compared to smokers. This wasn't the first when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored. He had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies. It was everywhere. Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, Back to our thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? Well, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between pubs to quit, you have cancer by then. If you wait, until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the next decade, to be dead by then. It took 25 years for the Surgeon General's report to came out, come out. It took 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You'd think maybe after the first 6,000, they could have given people a little heads up or something. <laughs> a powerful industry. One wonders how many people are currently suffering needlessly from dietary diseases. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. On one hand, as a smoker in the 50s, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other, all you had was the science. If you were even aware of studies like this. All right, well, let's fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. And it's not just one study, the total sum of evidence suggest that uh, mortality from all causes put together, many of our dreaded diseases, cancer, diabetes, stroke, all significantly lower among those eating more plant-based diets. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 1950s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? With access to the science, you realize you know, your eating habits are not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it can be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA went on record officially refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Maybe because they just got a $10 million check from the tobacco industry, perhaps. Okay, so we know why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't more individual doctors speaking out? Well, there were a few gallant souls ahead of their time, speaking up against industries, killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoked cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemic of dietary diseases. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the science, misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of secondhand smoke and toxic chemicals. The same paid by the 
candy industry, the National Confectioners Association, to downplay the risks of candy, and the same paid by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Animal products and processed foods kill at least 14 million people every year. 14 million people dead. Plant-based diets can now be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of quitting smoking. But until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. Uh, we can't wait for society to catch up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. How long do we have to wait until the CDC says, don't wait for open heart surgery to start eating healthy as well? You know, last year, the um, uh, Dr. Kim Wynn became the president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked why, in an interview, he follows his own advice, he gives to all of his patients, to eat a plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you very much. to share my talk with anybody. I was recently invited to give this talk at Google, and they made an official Google talk. So if you just go to bit.ly slash Google Gregor, you can share this talk with anyone for free. I also have a, a number of other, so this talk is just on leading cause of death. I also have um, uh, presentations on leading causes of disability and our most common diseases and our most dreaded diseases. And all, and I have my book here, I'm at all proceeds from the sale of my books, DVDs, and speaking engagements, all goes to charity. And all my work is available free at nutritionfacts.org. Can I take questions? I can take three questions. Maybe if I started earlier, I could have taken more questions. <laughs> That is a fantastic question. That fantastic question was, how do you get access to these medical journals? And how can we get access to these medical journals? Because then you can see the actual science yourself. You know, many of these studies were funded by you, by us. These are na the National Institutes of Health. This is taxpayer money funding the studies, but then the profits are, pri are privatized. These publishing companies that publish the journals don't let you know what the results are. They put it behind a paywall. They have to pay like 39 bucks just to get access to the study that you paid for. There is a growing movement now. Um, started with a uh, woman, a uh, PhD in Kazakhstan, who didn't, who's trying to do her PhD, did not have access to the medical literature. Her institution just wasn't rich enough to pay all these fees. And so she was a smart woman, and so she hacked into every academic publisher in the world and put all the journal articles in the world up on a website for free. And then found a way to make every article ever published by them in the future free on this website. The website is called, uh, uh, what is it? No, I got it. It's called SciHub.org. S-C-I-H-U-B dot O-R-G. It is illegal to go to S-C-I-H-U-B dot O-R-G. And you can get every, so SciHub.org. And there's a great article about this, a woman called the Robin Hood of Science. If you Google Robin Hood of Science, you'll read about this amazing story 
Um, and uh, it may not be up for very much longer. So, download the world's academic literature now. Yes? Hi. I just wanted to share a testimony, like, uh, coincide with what you've been talking about. I am 30 years old. I've been plant-based for two years, and I reversed uterine cancer, epilepsy, TCOS, depression, anxiety. I died twice in the past from seizures. You look good for it. <laughs> So when I say, how not to die, I really mean it. It's not a... Thank you so much for sharing your story. Yes. I'll, 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 I'll repeat the question, so... No, no, so... Uh, I can tell, I'll, I'll tell you, this is about her mother in the hospital has a, has a rather unique situation with a type of feeding tube, and I, I'll talk to you directly. Happy to have, I'll be out, I'll be right at the book table, sign and come up, and we will talk. So that doesn't really count, I get another question. Right? Yeah. Right? I'm doing it anyway. All right, yes. So I, I think today's world, I haven't done research on this, there are more vegetarians in the world than there are vegans. So is there True. a study that just compares the health of vegetarianism versus veganism? Any studies between that and on the Yeah, so if you if you remember that slide uh, with the Adventist 2 study that showed that compared meat eaters to flexitarians, to pescatarians, to lacto vegetarians to vegans, you can see in that final category there was a significant drop in risk between lacto vegetarians and vegans. So eliminating eggs and dairy from the diet significantly reduce the risk of the leading killers, hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, this is a consequence um, of the what we're all about. You know, unfortunately, this room will close in about 20 minutes and there's nothing we can do. It's the city of Tamarack. They're all, they're all good people, but the staff 